Hello and uh, welcome to the meetup. Uh, my name is Christo Ila. I am the engineering manager at Planet OS. And I'm going to be talking about how to simplify concurrency by using actors. There are many ways of doing concurrency. You can do multi-threading, but then you have to lock and things that you share between threads. You have to use mutexes and it's all very complicated. You can also try to use lock-free data structures, but then you have to be extremely clever. Uh, there are systems that do software transactional memory, but uh, there are, those are fairly few and far between and they take up a lot of resources. Uh, you can do message passing, you can use futures, but the thing that we're going to be talking about today is actors. So what are actors? As Oleg briefly mentioned, uh, actors are very lightweight objects uh, that uh, encapsulate state inside them and do not share their internal state with other actors and they only communicate by message passing. Uh, actors are organized into supervision hierarchies mm, and uh, the concept was actually invented quite a long time ago, already in the 1970s. Uh, the, one of the first implementations was er in Erlang, uh, in Ericsson. Uh, they used um, the actor systems to implement very high avail availability telephone switches, uh, which uh, have been rumored to have been running for decades by now and not have crashed once. Oh. Mm. Uh, <laughs> feel free to doubt that, but anyway. Um, and the good thing about actors is that you don't need to think in terms of threads and locks and uh, because uh, they communicate by message passing and the various other properties, they are distributable by design. The particular implementation of an actor system that we are going to be talking about is Akka. Uh, so Akka implements uh, the actor model mm, and it makes uh, remoting seamless and it works with Java Scala and also .NET. Uh, the best fit is with Scala uh, due to the features of Scala that Oleg briefly described, which are uh, case classes and pattern matching. Uh, and uh, it also does uh, thread scheduling for you and it's very well configurable. You can have uh, different settings for different sets of actors. Uh, and multiple thread pools and things like this. There's also a very simple diagram of what Akka basically does uh, on the side there. Uh, so you, but as we mentioned, actors communicate by passing messages to each other. Uh, there are two types of messages in Akka. Uh, the simplest one is tell. Uh, tell is just sends a message from one actor to another actor and expects no reply. Um, in the first example, there is a notify that just notifies the actor ref uh, uh, with the message hi. So the second option is uh, the ask, which basically is a tell, plus you get back a future that some time in the future will resolve to the reply from the other actor that you sent the message to. Uh, there's also uh, a couple of examples. First is of the ask example and then some very simple future examples as well. So you can send messages. Um, so message ordering is guaranteed be only between one, uh, one sender and one receiver or one actor pair uh, because of course multiple actors can send messages to one actor at the same time so then they can get interleaved. Uh, each actor, actor has access to a mailbox uh, and uh, one of the nicest thing is that messages can really be anything. Uh, usually you do want to keep them small and you do want to keep them serializable because if they're not serializable, for example, network tra transparency goes away. Uh, and if they are too big, you can have all kinds of interesting um, memory problems. Uh, we also mentioned that you can, if you do an ask, you get back a future. So what is a future? So the future is a way to retrieve results of concurrent operations asynchronously or synchronously. Uh, what this essentially means is um, that you create a future that does something and you get the value back sometime later, but you don't know when exactly. Uh, the nice thing, is about, thing about Scala futures is that they are composable. And uh, for example, uh, you can, if you have an IO operation that normally blocks, uh, then you can put that in the future. And if you have then another I.O. operation that also blocks but does not depend on the result of the previous I.O. operation, then you can run those concurrently if you have configured the thread pools uh, and uh, dispatches correctly. 
uh, which is very nice. And um, they also, if you do the dependencies correctly, then uh, basically you get a system um, where you can automatically run things parallel that can be run in parallel, but uh, things that depend on each other, the dependencies are automatically resolved. And ideally in an actor, uh, you don't want to block, because if you block for a long time, then uh, the actor cannot process incoming messages and the mailbox can grow and all kinds of bad things can happen. So um, you can use futures to avoid this. So how do you get an actor? Well, the first option is you can create an actor. Um, and actor is essentially, it's an instance of a class uh, plus uh, the state uh, of the actor. So each actor has its internal state that it does not expose, uh, but uh, can manage it itself. And the important part is also that each actor has a name. So here is an example how to create an actor. You don't do it yourself. You ask the actor system to create an actor for you. Uh, so you have to give it uh, the type of the actor and you have to give it the name of the actor. Uh, but what you get in response is not not an instance of the class that you specified. Instead, it's a reference to an actor. Uh, the good thing about this is that it actually hides the type of the underlying actor. So you have no way to access the methods or the internal state of the actor directly. But you can send messages to the actor ref, um, which basically means sending a message to an actor. Uh, and the good thing about the actor ref is that uh, you can pass it around. You can put it inside a message and send it to another actor and the other actor can use it just the same way as the first actor did. Uh, it's serializable. You can even pass it across the network and it will still work exactly the same way. So putting all this together, here is a short uh, actor code example. Uh, so first line is the import, the lines three to seven define a very simple protocol uh, that you can use with this particular actor. You have a question that you can ask the actor, the actor then responds with an answer, and you also have a simple case class called notify that just notifies the actor of something. Uh, then line 11 uh, defines the class that implements the actor. As you can see, it extends in a, the ACA base actor class. Um, on line 12, we have a very simple version of the actor's internal state. If you look closely, it's a var. Uh, that means it's uh, mutable. And it, uh, this is essentially the state of the actor that is not exposed anywhere. On line 13, you define the receive function, which is the place where all the messages that are sent to the actor end up. And inside this receive function, we have a match. Um, matching, matching clause, and on line 14 we match uh, the question message. And then we compute the answer to this question message and send it back to the actor that sent us the question. Uh, and then below also there is a very simple uh, this is a function that uh, does a very simple thing. It computes what is the meaning of life. So we talked about how to create an actor. But what if you want, don't want to create a new one, you already have an actor that can respond to these questions, so how do you get access to that? Uh, the uh, way to do that is called actor selection. Uh, this is a feature of Oka, and to the actor selection, you can give an actor path. So actor uh, path is something that is, is much like a directory path. Uh, essentially, it's a list of actor names separated by forward slashes. And the nice thing about uh, actor selection is that you don't have to know ex the exact path. You can have pattern matching within the path, uh, which also, of course, means that um, uh, in response you can get multiple actors. So that's why it's different from an actor ref. Uh, an actor selection can actually have multiple actors inside it. But you can pretty much treat it the same way as an actor ref. For example, you can send messages to all the actors that matched or at once. And uh, it is also transparently remote, like actor refs are. So we talked about the actor path. And the question is, how do we know the actor path? Uh, <coughs> the actors in Akka uh, are in a tree structure, uh, just as the path implied. So the root of the tree structure is the actor system itself. And then beneath that, there are two guardians, the user guardian and the system guardian. 
Uh, we're not going to be talking about the system guardian because it's an, basically an implementation detail of ACA and it's not particularly interesting. Uh, but um, we are going to be talking about the user guardian. Uh, because all the actors that you create and your application code creates go under the user guardian. Uh, and uh, if, you create, no, if you create an actor under the user guardian, for example, we call it all-knowing, and then if that actor creates another child actor, then uh, it will be created under this one and uh, you get the full path of user all-knowing oracle. So uh, this is a simple version. Uh, if the actors are in the local machine, then that's all there is to it. Uh, if the actors can also be in remote machines, then it's slightly more complicated, but not very much. So we talked about the supervision, uh, the hierarchy, but um, the nice thing about this is that we can also do supervision and error handling and make sure that our systems are reliable, which is, of course, one of the founding principles of uh, re uh, reactive systems. Uh, the way to do this is called an error kernel pattern. Uh, so essentially what happens is that if an actor uh, receives an error, for example, the actor throws an exception. So what normally would happen is that the exception gets propagated up the call stack, right? And then you have to catch it somewhere. Uh, but in an actor system, it's a little bit different. The error instead is propagated up the actor hierarchy. So this means that if a child actor um, receives an error, then its parent can decide what to do with this error. Right. Uh, so there are a number of options. It can just uh, say that I don't know what to do with this and escalate it further, in which case the same process applies to its parent and so on until it reaches the user guardian. Uh, and in this case, the whole actor system is shut down. Uh, there are a couple of other options. You can restart the child, you can stop the child, or you can resume the child. So um, realistically, restart and resume are really hard to get right because uh, since you don't know the internal state of the actor uh, you have to very carefully make sure that uh, that gets handled correctly in the cases of resume and restart and so uh, that's that has to be handled with care so that was the actor hierarchy and we also mentioned that actors uh, communicate by sending messages to each other so what happens to the messages exactly uh, so when an actor sends a message to another actor, uh, actually the message is delivered to a mailbox. Uh, each actor has access to only one mailbox. Uh, potentially the ma one mailbox can be shared between multiple actors. Um, this depends on the dispatcher type, but we're going to be talking about later. Uh, there are a number of different types of mailboxes that you can configure in Akka using the Akka configuration system. For example, you can have bounded mailboxes, which fill up and uh, accept no more messages after that. Uh, the default version is unbounded. You can have mailboxes that sort incoming messages by their priority or various other mm, properties of the messages. And uh, you can even define your own types of mailboxes if you do wish to do so. So essentially, this also means that while message delivery order is guaranteed by ACA for within one actor pair, but if the mailbox decides to sort the messages in a different order, then, well, that's that. Uh, so if you send a message, how reliable is this? Right. So local message delivery is reliable except for virtual machine errors. So if you send a message that's too large and can fit in the memory, obviously the JVM cannot handle that. Uh, the good, technically, you can uh, write code in a way that assumes that message delivery is reliable and in local machines it will work, but it's always better to write code that also works under different circumstances. So you usually want to do this, uh, uh, expect, you don't want to expect that message delivery, delivery is reliable. Uh, and of course, if the actors that send messages to each other are in different JVMs and if they are across a network, then, of course, it's completely unreliable because we all know that networks are unreliable by default. Uh, so essentially, this means that um, you have to write code that assumes that the message you sent might not get there. So sometimes this is perfectly fine. Right? 
uh, in many systems the uh, messages can be lost and uh, nothing really terribly bad happens. But if you have a system where message delivery needs to be reliable, then you have to write code uh, that handles this yourself. There are a couple of um, default met methods in ACA, in ACA that help you, like um, reliable proxy, uh, but uh, there are reasons to not use that all the time. Sorry about that. Uh, so what should you do in this case? So the easiest way is to just uh, send a message and the, after some time you should expect an acknowledgement from the receiver that he received the message um, and then if you don't receive the acknowledgement then you just send it again until you do. Right. So of course uh, this means that um, the receiver might receive the message twice because maybe it's just busy doing something else. Right. Um, so you have to handle this case. And the easiest way to handle this particular case is if you make message processing idempotent. And idempotency means that uh, well, essentially if you do the same thing twice or more, then the result doesn't change. Yeah. So in this case you can just send the message again and nothing happens uh, because the result is still the same. So we talked about um, how the message gets delivered to the mailbox, right? but we also need to talk about how the message gets delivered to the actual actor. Uh, the system that does this is uh, called a dispatcher in ACA. Um, and the dispatcher sits be between the mailbox and the actor and notices that if a new message is delivered to the mailbox, uh, then it um, schedules an actor to run on a thread. So the threads uh, are based on execution contexts, which are essentially thread pools. And you can configure those uh, um, based on the actor paths and various other properties, uh, either from a static configuration or you can even change it while the code is running. But then uh, the dispatcher schedules the actor to be run on a thread and then delivers the message to the receive function of the actor. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, the, when the thread is free to run, then the actor can run on that thread and process this message. And then uh, the dispatcher takes the next message and so on. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the way uh, that the actors and threads are decoupled. So essentially you can have a very large number of actors uh, and you don't have to have the same number of threads to handle uh, all the processing if, uh, if there are gaps, uh, if the, all the actors don't have to run all the time. Right. So we had a bunch of theory. So let's now look at some actual examples of systems that were built using ACA and the actor model. So first one that we're going to be looking at is um, is a dashboard uh, for a wind farm. Um, it's, uh, it's actually one of the largest wind farms in the world. <coughs> and uh, for this, uh, we built a real-time dashboard that shows data um, updating uh, constantly and also a bit of historical data on some graphs. Um, so there are two components to this particular system. One, the first one that we will talk about uh, is uh, is how to deliver data updates that are processed by the system to the dashboard. So the way that this particular system does it is via WebSockets because the, um, the UI is running on a web server. And um, the handling of this is based on uh, a web server which is um, based on Spray, which is a Spray, it's called SprayCan, it's just a project that uh, implements a web server. So there is uh, a connection manager actor. Uh, so when a new connection from a client comes in, then the connection manager actor receives this connection. Uh, and in response to this, it creates a new actor to manage just this connection. And then if the connection drops, it, uh, it kills the connection manager actor and uh, uh, makes sure that everything is running smoothly. And so this is essentially the actor hierarchy in this case, and it, it 
uh, the connection manager is essentially responsible for making sure that the child actors are working properly. Um, so this model uh, is it's a very, very nice model because uh, you don't have to have a separate thread for a connection, for example. And if uh, you have, uh, you can have a large number of connections, but you don't have to uh, have a very large thread pool if the data updates aren't that frequent. And it scales uh, very better than callbacks or event loops and uh, other such uh, methods. So now if we want to know how a data publish works, so this system uses Kafka for its queues. So and there is an actor that receives messages from the Kafka queue. Uh, so Kafka is just a regular message queue, um, just like RabbitMQ, for example. Um, and uh, so if a message comes in, uh, then it's delivered to the Kafka receiver actor. And then the connector, connection actors can um, tell the receiver actor, basically can, they can subscribe to message updates from the queue. And when the message comes to the queue, the queue actor distributes the message to the connection actors. And then each connection actor just serializes the message to the correct format and sends it to the WebSocket uh, using the WebSocket protocol. And all this uh, uh, works very nicely. And uh, you can have very, very simple, very self-contained actors that just handle this one connection. So does anybody have any questions? Is this, is this clear at all? <laughs> all right, that's very good. Um, so we talked about how to publish data. So now we also will look at how the data updates actually arrive to the system. Uh, so the system subscribes to data from various uh, external uh, systems, which are here on the left side. Um, uh, they deliver some data to a web service that simply receives this data and puts it in a Kafka queue, uh, which is then read by the processing component. So this is, uh, this is exactly what Oleg talked about when he was talking about reactive systems, is that you separate them out into components that talk to each other via message queues, uh, or, well, via messages. So you can basically scale each of these horizontally independently. Mm, and uh, they don't really depend on each other. Uh, for example, in our case, the web service and the process are completely different. They're running on different JVMs. So if the processing component uh, dies, for example, then the web service still continues to run and things like this. And if, if the processing needs uh, more processing power, then you can scale that independently of the web service. So uh, it gives us very nice properties of the system. Um, so. The, but then the processing component reads the update message uh, from the Kafka queue, and then it finds the correct actor to send the message to, and then those actors process it and deliver it to the dashboard. So actors in the processing component represent the main entity. So uh, you have one actor per turbine, for example. In this particular case, there are 160 wind turbines in the wind park. So there are 160 actors each representing just one particular wind turbine. Uh, and each wind turbine actor keeps the state of the wind turbine. For example, there is power production, the current power production. Um, the actor that receives the update from an external system, then it updates its, its internal state. But there is also an actor uh, called the power plant, which is the aggregate of all the wind turbines. Uh, and it keeps its internal, st internal state is the complete power output of this power plant. So then um, what happens, the way this is implemented is that all the wind turbines, after they have processed their own uh, internal state, then uh, they send, again by a Kafka queue, uh, they send updates to the power plant uh, actor, which then just sums those together and keeps uh, and outputs then the, uh, some of the turbines, which is, of course, the total output of the plant. There are also alerts. And actually, there are in the real system, there are various other types of entities, but I'm not going to go into too much detail here. 
So alerts are things that uh, join together multiple event streams. Uh, this means that uh, you observe one stream and if something happens there and you observe another stream and something that shouldn't happen happens there, then you can raise an alert. And this is also implemented via actors that are observing the events uh, output from uh, the domain entity or domain entity based actor. Uh, so this is the system, basically. Uh, the challenges that we had implementing this particular system mm, uh, were that we had to be very careful that the event updates are never lost. So uh, the alerts here in this particular system are for health and safety. So you know, if the turbine catches fire, you have to be really careful that the alert that the turbine is on fire is never lost. So we had to be very careful to not uh, lose messages due to crashes or restarts of the actor systems which means that we had to make sure that the message delivery is reliable. Uh, and that means that the actors have to handle idempotency, which I explained is that if you do the same, same thing twice, then the result doesn't change. And uh, since we do uh, update cascades so that one actor updates its state and then tells another actor to update its state as well, you have to have make sure that the, uh, the, even in the middle of the event cascade, uh, the uh, messages are not lost and the way this uh, is solved is to make sure that you never acknowledge uh, a message from the queue before you have written it to another queue. Uh, but of course the problem with this is that if you do this purely based on the actor model and Okka, uh, then you have to mix, uh, in your business logic code, you have to mix idempotency handling. Uh, and sometimes uh, this can get a little bit messy and if you forget somewhere, then uh, it is a potentially something that can result in an error. Um, there are mm, ways to avoid this, of course, and uh, actually one of the systems that helps a little bit with by, uh, to avoid this problem is, uh, uh, is the topic of the third talk uh, today uh, that Alexei is going to give a little bit later. But, so that was the first example. Uh, we also have another example. Uh, so this is uh, this is our planetized data hub. It's uh, available to look at. Uh, I'll call it the URL is data.planetized.com. Um, and what it does is uh, uh, it's it's uh, collect. You have access to um, open data sets and also commercial data sets, and we provide a unified API uh, to get access to all of this data. And for example, here you see uh, something called GFS, which is a global weather forecast. Um, and in this particular picture, there's a visualization, or well, it's a screenshot from data.planetized.com. Uh, it's a visualization of global temperatures, uh, I'm guessing maybe tomorrow or something like that. So what makes this site run is called something called the D-pipe, uh, which as the name implies, <laughs> is a data pipeline. And the data pipeline consists, what it can do is it can acquire data, transform data, analyze and index the data. Um, and the data that we are talking about is spatio-temporal. Uh, it can come from very many different sources. Uh, for example, it can be a model output, which is the weather forecast that I just showed. Uh, it can be, of course, it doesn't have to be global, it can be local. Uh, it can come from a satellite, for example, from some sensor installed wherever. Uh, there are many, many, many different types of data, like time series, gridded, and you can have point clouds. Uh, the variety here is very, very large. And the way the system is implemented is that it's a data pipeline. It has multiple stages. Uh, each of the stages uh, runs a cluster. Um, inside this cluster, on each node, there is an actor system. Uh, and inside the actor systems, there is a scheduler that uh, uh, we have that can uh, schedule data processing uh, based on priorities and uh, some other properties to run on worker actors. And this allows us to scale each stage independently. 
uh, which is again is the proper is a property of a reactive system is that if uh, if you need to scale something, you don't have to scale the whole thing. You just scale the thing that you really want to scale. Um, and uh, we use Kafka to communicate uh, messages between the different stages. Uh, within the stage, you can have multiple pipelines, um, again, in order to facilitate uh, getting high priority data out first. And uh, uh, the good things about the system is that we can scale linearly uh, with the number of data sources due to the fact that, uh, well, this is actually something that uh, Akka helps with quite a lot. Um, we can do forks and joins in the data pipeline. Um, so you can control parallelism uh, very carefully to, uh, to enable, again, more parallel processing to get to the end result faster. And the thing that we are very proud of is that we also have a framework that for exactly once processing uh, that actually scales linearly. Uh, which is a very, very nice thing to have. Uh, and if, as if it wasn't quite obvious, <laughs> we are in fact uh, hiring. Uh, we have solved a number of um, interesting problems, as you saw on the previous slide. Uh, there are still a very large number of problems that we need to solve. Uh, the types of problems go pretty much all over the spectrum. We have some problems, but probably need some sort of uh, AI to solve. And we, there are problems that need distributed systems to solve and everything in between. So um, in case you are interested, uh, I'm here. My name is Christo. <laughs> uh, my email address is also Christo at planetos.com. So come talk to me. And before you can start clapping, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Yeah. It seems that, that the, it's like maybe not very far from a uh, system like uh, managing a nuclear power plant or a, or a plane <laughs> fine. So other good examples of maybe not developed by you, but uh, by similar companies or, or other in reality APA used in such uh, environments. Uh, yeah, uh, Alexei is definitely going to have uh, an example that he's going to uh, talk about this in case it will be about authentication, for example. Uh, there are, it is getting uh, much, quite wide adoption, actually, the uh, uh, Aka and actor, actor systems, because, uh, you know, as Oleg talked about, the requirements are getting tighter and tighter and the things needs to, needs to scale. So, uh, I don't know, concrete examples, Oleg, do you have any concrete examples? So I think we have to account for the fact that if you have to do embed a system and you actually need to have guaranteed latency below 10 milliseconds, Java is the wrong choice, right? So uh, there always will be uh, layers of systems which are embedded like C++, maybe ADA, and uh, well, then there will be SCADA or whatever is the new hot thing. And Java will always be like at some point and also I hope nobody uses Java to really make decisions about the nuclear power plant. It's a big, big secret dream. Yeah, we, we, we can't run a nuclear power plant, I'm sorry. I think in the, in the whole of the Sun uh, license agreement was mentioned that Java cannot use the nuclear <laughs> power plants and then uh, flying uh, airplane traffic either. That, that makes sense. I don't read the uh, license <laughs> 10 years, but let's say 15 years ago it was still bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, I highly approve of the fact that if I'm flying on an airplane, then it's not controlled by Java, so that, that's great. <laughs> but Erlang? Uh, Erlang is fine. <laughs> well, okay, th that depends on if it's um, well, real-time systems. Yeah, you have to be careful, but I guess you can use Erlang. I'm not actually an expert in Erlang, so... I wouldn't use Erlang for that problem. Switches, yes. Okay. It's also, I think, garbage collected language. Oh yeah, and uh, in, I think in the FAA rules it says that you have to, you don't you can't use memory allocation while the software is running, so you probably can't use Erlang. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other? Wait, yes. this new set random Erlang box after your service change. It probably uh, changed, but yeah, it used to write the memory. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I have two questions actually um, about some of the actors. Uh, the, the example, one of the examples you had were. Uh, each on the dashboard, there were a lot of connections, and then the queue 
uh, queue, the Kafka queue new to send messages to the connections. So I have to question that in the the, the connections, yeah, exactly, register with that receiver actor somehow, right? So and earlier you said if if an actor encounters an error, it gets lost, and you better stop it altogether. So if the Kafka actor were to run into trouble, would all the connections be lost? Uh, or is there a way to kind of, uh, you know, because that receiver actor must maintain some space to know who to send the updates to, are there ways around it? Uh, yeah, so we, yes, so the way this is done is essentially, you, I mean, obviously you can do this differently, but uh, actually the easiest way to handle this in this case would be to have uh, an actor that is the, the parent actor of both the Kafka receiver and the connection manager, and then that actor essentially restarts the whole thing. So, but then you have to, uh, you have to be careful to make sure that the connections don't drop. And honestly, the way this is handled in this particular system is that the UI just if the connection drops, then the UI just reconnects. Right? So in this case, the system gets restarted essentially, uh, and uh, uh, all the subscriptions are re-established. Okay. So you could do basically that connection actor is monitoring the state of the Kafka receiver actor. And if it gets a message that the actor terminated, it can try again. There is, there is also a slogan of ACA team called let it crash and just restart. So. <laughs> Don't use it in ACA please. <laughs> and, and another question if I may to the kind of the same thing about the dashboard problem where I guess you get the initial data from the dashboard from somewhere else and that oh, receiver, right? Like how do you handle like is there, is there a risk of losing some updates because you get some initial data? It's not really an uh, yeah And then, then you start getting updates from the same that. Uh, yeah the this is uh, this is the way we handle this essentially is that uh, when the dashboard UI starts up, uh, the communication between the user interface and uh, uh, the connection actor is actually two-way. So the user interface, the, it was needed both for the initial state, just as you said. So essentially when the UI starts up, it asks, give me the complete initial state. Then, uh, and then the connection actor goes and actually queries the database for it. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, it's also needed, uh, there. you can click around and look at different graphs. So in this case also the user interface goes and asks uh, the connection actor give me you know the history of this particular entity or this, give me the power output over, over time of this. So it's a two-way communication but yes this is completely the application level problem. Yeah, uh, you in the back you also had a question. Yeah, can you share any practical life experience solving performance issues? It's a great framework but still might have some relevance. Performance issues. Well, there. Are, yes, you can. I mean, you can run into performance issues quite easily. If, uh, but you sort of you have to know what you're doing. Uh, Oleg, do you have any good examples? Well, two main things is that you have to carefully tune thread pools. If you don't have enough threads in your thread pools, there will be actors who could run, but they're just fiddling with their fingers. Especially if you have some blocking I/O operations. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, also with Java, if you create too much memory pressure, things get sad. It's just it's like Java, right? There is a non-stop garbage collector, but I don't think it's commercial. Yeah, but the, this is actually also one of the properties of reactive systems. The, what we do also in our data processing is uh, we put the parts that have different loads. For example, if one part has higher I/O load and the other operation has higher CPU load, then you can put those into separate uh, stages of the pipeline. So then you can uh, you can scale the stages dif differently. So you can put uh, the stage that needs I/O load on you know on a machine that has better I/O but less CPU, and uh, the other one on different machines. So that's actually one way to handle handle this uh, at scale. Sometimes also back pressure. Yep. It's fine. Uh, but do you uh, do you test and how like do you act or actors particularly do you unit tests on the receiver or whatever that method is somehow or is it is it more complex like when an actor starts another actor and another one and so forth can you have you 
Uh, yeah, uh, this this is a problem. Uh, it's uh, yeah, we have unit tests, but you know, on unit tests you're supposed to test like the smallest unit. So um, essentially, those just test it without the actor system, just the functionality, right? Um, Aka test kit provides features for this, mm, but we also test uh, the complete system. So essentially, the way to do this is the onion testing that Oleg briefly mentioned is that uh, you take like um, uh, the small subset of the actors start it up, send a message, and then just wait for a while and say, well, now we should have received the, uh, the output. Right? So the annoying part about this is that if you happen to run on a particularly slow machine, then it can time out. Uh, Docker test kit does provide a very simple functionality to handle this by simply scaling the timeouts depending on the machine that you're currently running on. Uh, but yes, writing tests for these systems that test uh, the full whole system. Uh, that's very hard. Yes. What do you use for the dashboard? Java for the UI or something else? Uh, I mean, the UI is running in a web browser, so it's in JavaScript. Uh, so if you have more questions about that, Ilya is around here somewhere, and he can answer all your questions because he implemented that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the way it's it's in JavaScript, running in a browser. Uh, and it communi communicates to the backend, which is written in Scala uh, over WebSocket. Yeah. How do you ensure uh, How do we ensure? Um, so uh, there are so uh, Kafka uh, has you know replication. Uh, then you can uh, the each stage is essentially a separate actor system that you can scale across a cluster of machines. So you can do it that way. Uh, and uh, well, that's essentially it, it. You have to make sure that each stage of the system and each queue of the system is uh, either replicated or, well, uh, in case you don't need to have very, very real-time updates, well, essentially, then you can just detect when it goes down and restart. It. Yeah. So, but of course, again, that depends on the application, obviously. Anymore? Yes. Most projects I've been working so far are using Rabbit as a message queue. I haven't used Kafka, so Rabbit seems to be kind of like a most to explain why you you prefer Kafka. Uh, we did use Rabbit in the beginning. Uh, so Rabbit, it has a couple of annoying properties. So let's say, um, so the way Kafka is built is that it's um, well, it keeps all the messages in in a log, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and then each client uh, keeps its own pointer to which message it has processed, right? So the Kafka itself doesn't actually know how much the client has processed where messages from the queue. It just it can notify when new messages arrive, obviously, to, so it knows what the clients are. Um, but the good thing about this is that if you add a client, for example. In RabbitMQ, if you take the message out of the queue, uh, and all, if all the listeners have taken the message out of the queue, then it's gone. Right? In Kafka, it's not gone. So let's say you need to, you want to build a system that uh, you want to test if this new processing system works. Right? So then you just connect it to the already existing Kafka queue, say start from the beginning, run the processing, compare the result. So this, for example, is one very nice feature. Uh, and it is a lot faster than RabbitMQ. And it can handle terabytes of data. So in RabbitMQ, it can terabytes of messages. I'm not sure what you By the way, Rabbit is written in your language. Mm -hmm. okay. um, any more questions? I'm happy to answer. Yes. Um, elaborate a little bit more on testing. I mean, unit testing an actor should be a fairly simple thing. Given this input, you should get that event out of it. Uh, and that's absolutely synchronous. You don't need to yep. anything asynchronous now. So using the test kit, uh, you what would you be testing, like using this layer or whatever approach? I mean, you don't want to test Aqua because that's being tested by the well, the guy the building it. So why why do you do that? Or what's the what's the stuff besides actors that you need to test that? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so you usually don't want your actors to be very large, 
Right? You want one actor to do one thing and do it well, and obviously, yes, in this case, uh, that particular functionality can run in unit test. Uh, but if you build a realistic system, then it will have uh, uh, many actors that talk to each other. Right? Uh, so let's say uh, in our system... Sorry to interrupt you. Actors talk to each other through messages, yes, right? Exactly. So each of them is just sending out a message whether they talk to another actor or does something else it really... Yeah. From a testing point of view, it really doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me give you a, like a very simple example. So in our data processing pipeline, um, it takes a data file, it transforms it to our internal format, uh, and then it uses, and then it runs through analysis. Right? So there are two ways to test this. So first of all, you can store the output of the transformed uh, transformation stage and feed it directly to the analysis stage, um, and then check if the output is correct. Uh, but if you have um, a method uh, of checking if the output is correct for the input file, then one, one test you could also run is do these stages work together. Right? So you, you just send the input file to the transformation stage, connect it in the test, test also connect, let it send the message to the analysis stage, and then you check if the analysis output is correct. So you can, um, you can, say, uh, you can also test the interaction between the actors because it can get uh, rather complex because, uh, because of the um, message delivery um, handling. So you, can, uh, if you have to test also the fact that if you drop a message, for example, if uh, the ACO test, test kit, by the way, provides very good ways to do this via the probes. So you can set up two actors that talk to each other, put the probe in between, and then uh, send an input message, see it goes through the pipeline, then tell the probe, don't forward the next message, drop it, right? Uh, and then, all, then try it again. Does it still work? Right? So you can uh, also test this. What are you testing in that example? I mean, you have two actors. Yeah. If, if the message that one sends to another is not passed on, yes. that's the, let's say, the fault of Arca, isn't it? No, but it can be the fault of the network connection, for example. Okay, but what are you testing then? Are you verifying that Arca is doing this job and then notifying someone or... Uh, what the, role do the actors play in that yeah, set situation? Uh, in the... Arca doesn't, as I said, Arca does not provide uh, any guarantees. So, so the guarantee that Arca provides for messages is at most once. So a message gets delivered at most once. But that means that the message can be dropped. Uh, and if it goes over a network, this happens quite a lot. Um, due to the network being uh, unreliable. So one thing that you should test is that if the network is unreliable, does the system still work? And to do this, you have to test multiple actors that talk to each other. If I may, I could provide a better form. So in object-oriented programming, you write your system by wiring up many small objects together into large objects, which call some methods and so on, right? The way I think you test it is that you test small objects first using unit tests, and you wire up with larger objects or subsystems and then test them and so on. So think that instead of method calls, you have message exchanges. And instead of objects, you have actors. It's basically like the same idea. I'm not sure if it makes sense. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand who is responsible then, or is it the, if actor A is sending a message to actor B, is actor A responsible of making sure that the message gets through? I, I, that it or is it, some, is it some other layer that's yeah. responsible? If, the, if we assume that the uh, application is uh, something that requires the message to be delivered, then your application is responsible for making sure. Okay, application, but that's not the actor. Uh, yeah, but the application essentially is a collection of actors. So if I'm writing an actor, I'm writing some business logic of uh, whatever I do, I transform a file into some format. Yeah. But then I also have to make sure that if I send out the message, how do I make sure that it gets delivered? So as you said, Arca only says at most once. Yeah. So how do, do I detect inside the actor, in the first actor, that it wasn't once, it was zero, basically? Uh, yeah, essentially that's what you do. Uh, then okay. the, way, the simplest way to do this is uh, to uh, in the protocol, right into the protocol that if you send a message from A to B, then B must reply, I received the message. Right? So it must send the message back to the original sender saying, I have this message, I'm going to work on it now. 
Uh, and essentially then what you do is actor A sends the message and expects a reply within, I don't know, a minute, 10 seconds, whatever time span you define. And if it hasn't received a reply, then it tries again, right? Until it receives a reply. Okay, but that's everything you have to write your own code. Uh, read yeah. by all that. Uh, okay. There is, there is a component called... Uh, Reliable proxies. Reliable proxies. Yeah. So I think the idea is that when you write your own application, which is the end of it, what you will end up with is lots of small actors which communicate according to some kind of protocol. And there are some consistency statements and invariants <coughs> this in your head, similar to how you write sequential code. And then uh, you want to prove to yourself that the code you wrote actually matches the invariants you assume. If you write some kind of I don't know, priority queue, you actually want to verify that the priority queue you wrote, the job queue, actually is a, like, follows the priority of the tasks, and so on. So you're not testing really ACA, another like within the framework of ACA, your application does and guarantees the consistency you would think it does. Because there are a number of applications where it's completely fine to drop messages. Right? I mean, if you're, I don't know, counting user clicks. Uh, approximately, right? You know, you know, drop one out of a hundred, nobody cares, right? Yeah, okay, I think the misunderstanding from my part is that I thought Docker gives you a lot more, let's say, infrastructure around your actors where you can only say that, send this thing out and I really don't care how it gets. It really does. Like Act of Resistance basically allows you at least once delivery. The next talk will have okay. to talk about that. So just, that's just one way how to do it. Sorry, yes. Yeah, no, perfect, fine. Um, yep. Yeah, I had a comment about uh, running 10 view and uh, duplicating the event stream for uh, processing it in par parallel by two consumers. I'm pretty sure you can do it in Rabbit 10 view. For example, if you have a focus exchange, you just have two queues and find it for the same. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you can do that, but. You can't do that after the fact. Oh, sure, you can go back in time. Yeah, exactly. But in Kafka, you can go do it whenever you want. Mm, any more questions? And feel free to ask us. You know, we have plenty of time. So. 12 minutes to be exact. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, OK. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah.